Hey everybody, and welcome back to the channel. I have sustained what seems to be a rather gruesome finger injury from playing kickball, which is uh, maybe the most masculine thing that I could have ever possibly done as a software engineer, and uh, is actually going to get in the way of me doing work. Um, it's just my pinky, so it should be pretty chill. Uh, but it is a little annoying to code now, so that's kind of a pain in the butt. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and jump into what I've done over the last week and uh, talk about some cool snapshot reads. So again, kind of the goal of all of this continues to just be um, performing a bunch of snapshot reads from a variety of query engines. The reason for that is that um, when you can perform snapshot reads and you can increment the valid offsets of a given table in multiple different places uh, through just one metastore, it means that we can have transactional semantics between them without any sort of crazy checkpointing engine like Flink or something like that. You know, it becomes really simple to just be like, I want to move data from this system to this other system. And I want to do that in a way such that, you know, if I'm querying the data, I'm only going to see it on either one system or the other. Um, so that's really useful in the batch moving case. It's really useful in the streaming ingestion case because now I can basically say, if I'm taking in data from Kafka, uh, you know, I'm committing my Kafka offsets atomically with how I am, you know, committing data into that table. So there's a lot of advantages here. And so far in the last couple of episodes, we tried to basically support reading uh, from this type of data harness in Trino um, using first uh, a bunch of different Kafka uh, partitions and then next Hootie tables because Delta Lake and Iceberg already work in Trino for doing time travel reads. Now, the good thing is that um, the Hootie table change is actually getting reviewed by people who have the ability to plus two or, or approve the change, which is awesome. Um, the Kafka change has really not been looked at at all, so I'm going to have to try and uh, push for that a little bit more. But a nice positive uh, you know, thing is that I got my contributor licensing agreement signed. I spoke to the literal CEO of Starburst Data, which is the company that is responsible for maintaining Trino, which was pretty sweet, and he approved that for me, so that's pretty cool. Um, so what are we doing next? Well, if we're handling all of these log-based message brokers and we're handling, you know, performing snapshot reads on Hootie, Iceberg, and Delta Lake, the last step is going to be to try and use a normal transactional database as well. Because in my mind, those are kind of the three different types of systems that can really be storing data for us. There's, you know, the transactional database, there is uh, the data lake, and then there's also just going to be, um, you know, the log-based message broker. And so, and maybe you can add stuff like Flink to that if people are eventually like, oh, I actually want to query data when it's cached in Flink, but I think that's going to be out of scope for now because uh, that's a little bit too compl uh, complicated here. But basically the idea is, okay, well, what database can we actually do this with? Well, for me to be able to support um, you know, a situation where you're performing these uh, time travel reads on a particular database because we need to be able to you know, maybe go back a few seconds or a few minutes in time to see a prior state of the database, um, we need to pick one that actually can support that because by default, MySQL and Postgres just can't do that. They have to, um, you know, they, they have to operate in a way where they only show the current set of the data and there's not really a way to do uh, these historical queries. They might operate using MVCC, meaning they may store slightly old versions of data uh, so that you can have consistent snapshot queries in a, a MySQL or a Postgres table in isolation. However, it doesn't mean that you can just specify a random timestamp from the past and read the table as of that version. So I've actually done a little bit of research and figured out which versions or which basically databases do actually support this type of thing. And I've kind of come up with basically four. I think uh, the first one is Google Spanner, which we know does that because Spanner is keeping track of a timestamp for every single one of its writes. They're linearizable. Uh, and you know it, it offers you the ability to actually read the table as of a prior timestamp that is user specified. Spanner does that. I'd say the open source clone of Spanner is basically CockroachDB, which is really awesome. But CockroachDB has another big positive, which is that CockroachDB supports the Postgres SQL wire protocol. So whereas I could you know build this for Spanner, and that actually may work kind of well because, for example, like Spark has a Spanner connector and it can read from that. Uh, Trino has a Postgres SQL connector. So if we're going to try and build a connector to read from CockroachDB, we can actually build off the Postgres connector, which is really, really cool. Um, something very similar to CockroachDB is YugabyteDB, kind of same idea. As far as I can tell, it seems like the main difference is that CockroachDB is trying to assign an actual like clock timestamp to everything, similar to Spanner, and maybe Yugabyte is using some more like centralized system, like a timestamp oracle to do that. 
Um, the syntax is also a little bit different between them. So CockroachDB, uh, you know, if you're reading a table, for example, um, you're using this as of syntax time syntax. And so you might do like select star from table as of system time X. And that's how you would read from a system time in CockroachDB. For Yugabyte, it's a little bit different because you actually set a session property. So before you run your select star query, you would do, uh, you know, set session property X, uh, where timestamp equals blank and whatever. And then now all of a sudden you can uh, do reading from a particular timestamp. So I actually figured that CockroachDB was gonna be a little bit better there and maybe um, you know, kind of more feasible from a syntax perspective. As far as I can tell, there's also another database called TyDB, where what's interesting is that CockroachDB and YugabyteDB both support the Postgres wire protocol, but TyDB, very interesting, supports the MySQL wire protocol. So this is really nice because you know, um, MySQL nor Postgres allow random time travel reads, but because of the fact that TyDB and uh, you know exists, I might be able to do this for both a Postgres-like implementation and also a MySQL-like implementation, which is going to hopefully offer a lot of flexibility to a lot of teams based on the database system that they currently use. What's really nice is that, as far as I can tell, TyDB actually has something called TySpark, where you can actually read from Spark uh, with it already. So when I move on from Trino and I try and do something really similar here uh, in Spark, I may actually be able to do it really, really easily for TyDB in particular, which is very cool. Um, now what's worth noting is that, you know, despite CockroachDB saying, oh, we're compatible with the Postgres wire protocol, that doesn't necessarily mean that I can just use the Postgres connector in its vanilla form in Trino and read from CockroachDB. Actually, it kind of does, and in practice, that's kind of the experience that I had, but there are a couple of small alterations that I ultimately had to make in order to make this work with the kind of time travel queries that I'm looking to do. So I'll go ahead and demonstrate those in a second. Okay, so let's get into the internals of this thing a little bit. Um, long story short, basically, I knew that I wanted to run a very simple local CockroachDB instance, so I just went ahead and did that using Docker. So, uh, you know, if you have Docker installed, you just go ahead and pull whatever image that you want. You can run it pretty quickly, and then from the command line, you can spin up a CockroachDB client that you can use to actually connect to that Docker image. So you map a port in the Docker image to one of your host local ports, and then all of a sudden you've exposed localhost, whatever you map to, uh, for you to be able to query. Again, basically the idea here is that you want to use this syntax as of system time in CockroachDB to actually go ahead and query exactly what it is that you want. So if I go over here, um, Trino also just has all of these JDBC connectors. So you've got a variety of different databases that implement the JDBC protocol. And as a result of that, there are now like 10 or you know even more than that different JDBC connector variants in Trino one of which is Postgres. Like, like I mentioned, CockroachDB is implementing the wire Postgres protocol, uh, or the Postgres wire protocol, so it should really be very similar to actually go ahead and you know, make CockroachDB work once you've gone and just hooked it up as a Postgres instance. And the hard part is then just gonna be wiring in the literal SQL string to do this as of system time using the passed in version timestamp that we give in Trino. So I'm just gonna go to my terminal quickly you can see I've got, uh, this is my CockroachDB client, so we're not looking at Trino at the moment. I've got some table that basically has the following. So CRDP, CRDB internal MVCC timestamp is an internal timestamp to CockroachDB, which basically says what time a given row was committed. And so as long as we're within the garbage collection threshold of our CockroachDB table, you can actually roll back and see the state of the table as of a previous time. So you can see right now in this table of people, we've got two entries for Big Dick Rick, and then we've got Jordan and Corinna. Now, while that sounds like a lovely uh, group of four to be a part of, and I would be honored, the reality is we only need one Big Dick Rick. So the CockroachDB syntax that you wanna use instead is to basically do a select star as of system time, and then I'm gonna pick a system time that's lower than the right for the second Big Dick Rick. So you can see I've done that right here where I'm using uh, 13, instead of the 14, that is the last right entry. And you can see all of a sudden now there are only three entries in the table. So that's pretty good uh, because it means the cockroach is working as expected, but now we wanna just go ahead and do that uh, in Trino. So let's go ahead and try it out. You can see I've already got something pulled up right here, but basically I'm gonna select star from cockroachdb.public.people. That's kind of how you wire in the table name. Um, I've got uh, if you look at my IDE here, I've got some cockroachdb.properties, 
which is right here, which is basically just saying, okay, I'm connected at localhost port 5432. I'm not using SSL, so I don't have to authenticate or anything like that. Uh, the name of my database table is default DB, and I'm connecting as user root. And so I'm just using the Postgres connector right here. And that actually works pretty much right out of the box. I didn't even have to make any code changes for me to do that select star from this table. What I did have to change was to do something like this, where in Trino I can now say forward version as of something, 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 and all of a sudden I'm performing the same exact timestamp filtering that I would be doing from my Cockroach CB client. So you can see I'm using the same version that I used before, and now I'm only getting three rows back, which is really great. Now CockroachDB has a configurable garbage collection threshold, which you can actually set seemingly arbitrarily high. So I can basically say, hey, for the last week, you know, store any data that even if it's technically uh, been overridden or deleted, you're gonna keep that around and then eventually we'll clean that up. But that's gonna allow us to do things like time travel. It's gonna allow us to have transactional semantics over multiple tables at a time. It's a really cool thing. So again, CockroachDB is effectively like, you know, it's implementing like an interface that is Postgres. It's trying to seem just like Postgres. And so that's really, really nice for people who are already using Postgres and maybe want a very, very similar interface to that. So anyway, how did I do it? Uh, long story short, everything in uh, JDBC is kind of all derived from, sorry, it's kind of small on my screen here, but if you follow my mouse on the left side of the screen, there are a bunch of, there are a bunch of classes for a base JDBC plugin, Trino base JDBC. Now basically what this is gonna do is it's going to allow you to query just about any JDBC connector. And at the core, you basically just need to tell uh, Trino, hey, you have all these columns. Um, you know, they've got types from your system that implements the JDBC protocol. Uh, you know, what types do they represent in Trino? So you're basically doing all of that. Now, fortunately, I don't wanna do all of that and it probably wouldn't be that easy either. I would imagine it'd be an arduous task. So what I really liked is that I can just hop onto the existing Postgres SQL client, which as you can see over here is overriding the base JDBC client. So it's, it's using the majority of the methods that are defined in this abstract class and then making some changes on top of that. Now this is a pretty hefty abstract class. As you can see, it's 2000 lines. So I don't really wanna be writing that myself. I wanna be hopping onto the thing that someone else wrote for the Postgres client, which itself is another 2000 lines. So instead, I yet again extended the Postgres client into one more thing, which is called the CockroachDB client. Now the CockroachDB client is pretty simple. Uh, I would disregard this for now. This is mostly testing. This is me hiding uh, some columns that CockroachDB returns by default that uh, kind of break things. Um, in this case, basically what I'm doing is I wanted to do one thing. Postgres by default is doing reads transactionally, which is not great because then Cockroach doesn't like that for doing the as of system time because it wants everything in the read to use the same exact uh, read system timestamp. So I basically overrode um, the Postgres client to not do transactional reads. Um, and then also I am now doing a little bit of extra work to wire in a potential end version to read from the table so that we can do these reads as of. And then I'm taking my end version. I am gonna go ahead and basically parse it to a string, which is happening right here. And then I'm popping it into what's known as the table handle. Now the table handle is what gets passed around and that's information that we use to actually read a table. So now if I go over here to my CockroachDB query builder, which is extending the version of the query builder that we use for the Postgres uh, connector, which is called the collation aware query builder, we have this one function that can be overridden, which is called get from. So get from is basically forming the SQL statement that says, you know, from table X. And so what I can do here is I can pass in my JDBC table handle and say, hey, if my JDBC table handle has a read version set, all of a sudden I can now add my as of system time parameter to it, just to that SQL string and pass it along. So it's actually not too hard to make this change. It's mostly been a lot of wiring and a lot of scaffolding to get this done. Now I will say for the actual tests here, it's gonna be a real pain to, to get this committed to open source. Given the, the difficulty that I've had with comments from other people so far, I know that this is gonna get a lot of scrutiny and I don't even know if people would be interested in me making a CockroachDB connector 
if the whole point was basically just to expose time travel reads, right? Like it's a very small amount of functionality for an entirely new connector. That being said, at least on the testing end, uh, you know, here I am spinning up a cockroach DB Docker image in my test, similar to what they do for the Postgres test. And then I'm now also extending the test Postgres connector test, meaning that I'm now going to run like the 300 plus uh, test suite of queries that we run for Postgres DB. Now, so far, what's good is that I'm passing like maybe 250 of those, but there are some nuances between the, the data that Cockroach DB returns versus what Postgres returns, which is going to effectively stop some of these tests from working. So if I really want to get this thing working and I really want to put it up as a commit for open source, which is my goal here, I'm going to have to probably fix all of those tests and then, uh, you know, kind of hammer out all of those edge cases that are breaking all of these unit tests. And then also write a couple of my own to uh, ensure that things work properly with version tables. But uh, yeah, hopefully this video was pretty interesting. I think this is where the real impact comes in. Like, it's not too hard to do transactional reads over Kafka and transactional reads over something like Iceberg. Um, but when you start incorporating kind of smartly picked databases like Cockroach or Yugabyte or TyDB or Spanner, then you can do some really, really interesting things with basically you know, making the database part of the data lake house. And I think that's really, really interesting. So I'm curious to hear what you guys think. Um, you know, I'm not gonna have any code up this week just because I'm in a little bit of a rush to, to get this done and, and just don't have too much time. But I'm hoping by the time uh, next week's video comes around, I'll actually have a well-formulated commit here and maybe just an update on uh, that hoodie feature that I was building as well last week because I think we're actually starting to get some traction there. I do see some committers taking some interest in that change. So I will see you guys in the next video. I hope that you enjoyed it and have a great weekend.